Welcome everyone to another episode of Podium Stories. Today I have a really special guest in the building, my friend Tarud. I'm going to introduce him first, but first of all, Tarud, thanks you, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me on the podcast. Absolutely. Uh, Tarud is the Associate Director of Sales and Partnerships at Local. Local is a hyper-local news and media platform uh, catering to the next billion audiences in India who have just come online in the last four years. The platform provides hyper-local news, stories, videos, jobs, classifieds, and more in regional Indian languages. Uh, and what I think is really special is Tarut has worked as a journalist, producer, and has built media operations for startups in India. He also brings an international perspective, having lived in India, Europe, and even the United States at different points in his life. And today we're going to be talking about how to penetrate the Indian market and the cultural differences in business and marketing. Uh, like I said, uh, Tarut, you and I have met, I believe, a month, month and a half ago. We had a very interesting conversation. And yeah. I think that's, that's what triggered me to have you in the podcast. I, th I was mentioning this before we recorded it, but when I prepare and do my research for the podcast, yeah. this, I often have a lot of questions, but this time it was crazy. And I had so many. And I think if you're listening, you, you're going to get a lot of value out of it because it's something that we don't see very often. And I appreciate you so much for, for taking the time to do this. Um, so, yeah, so I really thing, hope I can live up to the limit. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure you will. You helped me last time we talked. So I just wanted to make sure we recorded this uh, so that people can also enjoy it. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to ask you, uh, one of the main problems or one of the main issues I see when people um, go to countries that they're not used to because our audience is mostly people in the United States and in Europe, uh, usually business leaders. Uh, so one of the things that they struggle with is the cultural differences in meeting new people and building new relationships with countries that, that they're not used to as much. Mm -hmm. So what are, do you think are the differences between that, how that plays out in Europe or the United States and how that plays out in, in India? Um, do you think they're more closed or close down to building new relationships? Do you think they're more open? How do you, how do you think it, it differences? So, um, you know, I'm no expert on how to do business in America and Europe because I spent, you know, less than a year or so in both places. But um, from what I've seen, Indians are a little bit more like Americans, um, okay. where they're more open to talking to you, they're more open to having the conversation, thank you for the talk. a lot more. This is an American or Indian, you can say hi to them, you can have their initial conversation, but taking it forward is a little bit harder. Right. So I think, I think um, to say there are differences or any generalizations is hard because while there are, you know, we're in different countries, different continents, the world is getting smaller. I mean, just the fact that we're doing this podcast during a lockdown is proof right. of the fact that we're doing, we have a smaller world now. So people have American mannerisms, they have European mannerisms, and same way around, if you work in India for long enough, you have Indian mannerisms. You get used to the fact that if you're going to go out on the sales trail on a day, you're going to be having five different cups of tea with five different snacks with five different clients. That's just <laughs> what it is. You're not going to have lunch because you're too busy having snacks all day. <laughs> so uh, I think the number one thing is you've got to have a bigger appetite and you've got to be able to handle Indian food. It's a lot harder to do work with Indians if you're not going to eat the Indian food in their office. <laughs> so I think my record is seven cups of tea in a day. <laughs> that, that's interesting because um, I personally haven't seen it happen that, that much, like being able to like uh, have a cup of tea or, or some snacks. Um, we, we do go for, for beers or for drinks sometimes. I also meet for coffee. Do you see that happening as well? Like, do you see business relationships over, over alcohol, for example? Yeah, so let me just clarify. The cups of tea are kind of, you go to someone's office and because okay. India is very big on hospitality, they'll have an office boy, someone who bring you a cup of tea, some biscuits, some snacks, just for, okay. it could be a five minute conversation. Wow. But everyone gets some chai and you're just, that's what you're doing. The conversations over a beer or over dinner or something like that, those happen as well, but those are more with relationships that have been developed a little bit it's not a first time meeting gotcha. not going to go out for a beer for the first time gotcha that, that makes sense that makes sense uh do you think people usually meet a lot of people in india don't drink so that's not something you should assume 
Yeah, for sure, for sure. Do, do you think people meet at their offices often, or do you think they meet at common spaces? Because uh, in in America, there's a lot of times that people meet at Sorry, like. Can you say that again? I think you got cut out for a bit. Yeah, no problem. Uh, do you think people meet at office mostly, or do you see that people meet? I mean, obviously not right now with everything that's going on, but uh, before when, when things are normal, do you do you see that people meeting? offices or do you see them meeting at common spaces for example in america a lot of people meet in like hotel lobbies um so mm. what have you seen mo most common in, in india so i think it's definitely more common to meet people in an office because um especially the bigger businesses that you work with they tend to have a conference room or some kind of room you know set out for this Gotcha. And the whole idea of hospitality again, right? Give you a cup of tea that all comes within, come to my office, I'll take care of you and we can talk. Right. And I'm guessing that the idea of hospitality is not only business related, right? But I'm guessing personally yeah. as well, if for foreigners coming in, like, do you think you guys are, are a very hospital society as well, personally? I think so. I think hospitality is a very big cultural trait in India. I mean, if you look at, we're a little spoiled that way when we go to hot hotels. Mm -hmm. We've got uh, the staff who will go above and beyond. Everyone will, from the minimum wage guys to the general managers. So I think hospitality is just driven in India. I mean, uh, I mean, I'm trying to think of an example. Oh, okay, perfect example. When you're in a hotel and there are buffets, right? Morning buffets in almost every hotel. In India, people will actively come up to you. Staff, the waiters, whoever it is, will actively come up to you and offer to serve you even though there's a buffet. So they will go to the buffet. Stand in line, get you a plate full of food and bring it to your table. Wow. Versus I can't imagine ever doing that in America. No, I would not. <laughs> yeah. So it's just, uh, we have that culture. So it translates into when you, you know, sales meetings or any other meeting. That's so interesting because cultures to me are, are, are super interesting. Um, being raised in, in Europe, but being born in America and then going to college in America, but coming back to Europe, to me, I, I've seen these two cultures, um, really closely uh, and one of the things that americans do have than europeans have less is that they're more risk um supportive so they're okay with taking more risks versus europeans who are more risk averse right like they right. they don't enjoy risk that much uh where do you think india uh, and of course we're talking about cultures which is super general and yeah each, each person is different but where, where do you think india falls on that scale so, India, I mean, you have to, when you talk about cultures, again, India gets split into hundreds of different cultures. So you've got so many languages, so many little, right. uh, different cultures going on. There are definitely some cultures. So, for example, there's a state called Gujarat. And this is a bit of a stereotype, but they're the more merchant kind of state. They're better at business in gotcha. the stereotype. So, they're a little bit more okay with taking risks. I see. But I'd say overall, India is closer to Europe. We're a little bit more risk averse. I mean, that's one of the things America stands out for, right? The fact that yeah. banks and governments are willing to put out money, willing to financially back projects that have a lower rate of success. For sure. That's where America gets a lot of their uh, tradition of the American dream and all that. Yeah. So India, I think, is closer to Europe in that sense, closer to Britain specifically, because we were ruled by them for a long time. A lot of our you know, laws are still British laws that have been copied over. Right. So we're a little bit more conservative. We don't talk about our money as much. And, but that, I think that's changing with the influx of VC money uh, over the last 20 years or so, 15, 20 years. There's definitely a bit more of a culture of, hey, I don't need to make profit from day one. Let's build something. Let's scale something. Let's see where we're going. And then you know, five, 10 years down the line, we can take a decision whether we're succeeding or failing. I like that. So I have two questions from that. The first, you, you already started mentioning uh, what are the main cities and regions that like foreigners that want to do business in India? And I'm guessing it depends on the type of industry, but if they want to be surrounded by other business owners, entrepreneurs, where are the cities or regions that you think a foreigner should go to? Oh, so um, I think Mumbai and Delhi are the ones that stand out immediately. Delhi is the capital. They're the closest mm -hmm. to the power. It's easiest to make deals. Mumbai is the financial capital. Okay. Uh, and it's a port city, so that works out in all different directions. Um, Bangalore is doing really great when it comes to tech and the new startup world. Hyderabad is another city that's great with tech and startups. 
Um, and then you have traditional larger cities like Chennai, Calcutta, again, port cities that have just a tradition of some kind of business tradition because they were the centers of commerce for the British Empire. Oh, I see. So they, they're not as big as a Bombay or a Delhi, but they're big enough that they're still growing. I mean, Indian cities have populations into the, you know, the millions. Right. 10 million is not the largest city. You know, 15 million, 20 million, we have cities of all sizes. That's crazy. So when you reach that kind of number, there's bound to be a significant population who are running business, who are trying stuff out. Yeah. So I remember I was reading a report last year, it talked about the fact that I think the equivalent of about 8 to 9 million small and medium enterprises in India. Wow. Which uh, we're talking about like a corner store. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So entrepreneurship self entrepreneurship is pretty big. Now, whether you're talking about foreigners coming down, this is a funny thing I've seen where, sure, if you take a picture of, you know, a financial street in Bombay or Mumbai, um, you may not see a lot of white faces. But right. that doesn't mean they're not there. It just means that there's so many people that there's a lower proportion. But there's a pretty thriving foreign um, community of businessmen in Bombay, in Delhi, in Bangalore, where I live. So I know that for a fact. And the VC community, again, is another great place to see, you know, Chinese investors, Western investors, all hanging around. Um, the industries to get in are probably tech. Tech is probably the one place where foreigners can walk in. Manufacturing, if you're willing to do deals with some of the Indian firms, obviously another great place to walk into. So I think there's a lot of opportunity because people want to interact with foreigners. Right. Have you seen like an influx of foreigners over the last few years uh, coming into India more uh, to, for tech? for manufacturing um, now uh, that they can like 30 years ago, if they, you were doing business with India, maybe it was harder to come and, and mm. visit and have a personal relationship. But do you, okay. have you seen that people are coming in or it's just been going like sure. that for a long time? No, no, sure. So, okay. So I think maybe it's a little history lesson. I'll keep it short. Yeah. Uh, so India in the early nineties um, opened up from a very socialist economy to a liberal economy. Right. where we went from having one commercial airline, which is publicly owned, to having about 20, 10 years ago. So uh, it's, it's opened up a lot, obviously. Mm -hmm. In the last 25, 30 years, since 1991, 1992, it's become a lot easier to do business. It's become a lot easier to invest in businesses in India. Now, government policies change. You know, you might, at current moment, certain policies make it hard to invest in India. But certain policies make it easy to set up manufacturing in India. Makes sense. So, for example, Apple is a great um, example of this because importing mobile phones into India has become more expensive in the last five years. But manufacturing phones has become cheaper. So Apple phones that are manufactured in India, like the I think the iPhone 5 still has a manufacturing unit in India. Right, right, right. That's still doing well because Apple do, does a lot of reselling, right? A lot of yeah. buy the old model. Because people still get the prestige of owning an iPhone. Yeah. So those are doing well versus an iPhone 10, iPhone 11, maybe is not doing as well as it would do in Bangladesh or Sri Lanka, or comparable closer markets. Makes sense. Makes sense for sure. Um, I just think personally from the outside, it seems like such an interesting market to get in that I'm surprised that more foreigners uh, don't come in. Uh, which is one question that I wanted to ask you. So, like, why don't you think th there's not more people coming in and, and trying to do business there? So, especially from Europe and America. Yeah. I, so, I, I think know America from, actually has a lot. You have, okay. Um, yeah, American, or at least American companies come down a lot. Maybe individuals may not come down a lot, but companies definitely come down a lot. Okay. And, see, it's, it's a hard one. Um, because we still have a lot of protectionist measures. We still have a lot of taxation to protect you know, local um, industries. Mm -hmm. And a lot of taxation over money going out. But the one thing I think is tough to overcome, it's tough to overcome for us as well, sitting in India, is we are so heterogeneous as a country, as a population. Right. It's really, really hard to come and say, hey, I'm going to target you know, the 1.4 billion people living in India. Yeah. Me and my neighbor are completely different people. Right. We will not use the same companies, the same products, the same services. Makes sense. So, and I mean, the way I think about it is, um, think about London. Yeah. It's a big multicultural city, right? You've got Im internal immigrants, you've got 
Londoners from different parts. I mean, Lon- Londoners from East London, Londoners from West London are different people. Completely. And then you've got, you know, Asian immigrants, you've got Caribbean immigrants, you've got European immigrants. And it's just a whole mix of stuff. So just walk in and say, hey, I'm going to target this 10 million people living in London or more. I don't know what the population is, but millions of people living in London. It's not viable. It doesn't make sense. Right. You can't target um, middle income, poor with uh, high income, London. It just doesn't make sense. You've got to figure out who you're going for. And India is a lot of that. We've got so many different cultures, so many economic classes, so many uh, social classes. To come in and say, hey, I'm going to deliver a product that goes for the mass is very, very hard. Of course. So one of the things that um, I meant to ask you as well is with, with local, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys are targeting India region two and forward, right? Um, yeah. So can you walk me a bit more on like the differences of between regions and how you guys like differentiate between them as well? Okay, so local is essentially, as you told me, uh, told us in your intro, local is essentially a media platform that works on a very hyper local level. So village level or a district level, you know, right. something the regions that get ignored by the major media outlets, because it just doesn't make sense. Um, so how the Indian cities are classified are tiers, so tier one, tier two, tier three, tier four, and it's basically population wise. So 5 million plus, sorry, uh, half a million plus, a population is a tier one city. Okay. And it breaks down to 250,000 to 500,000 tier two and breaks down more and more as you go down. Okay. So essentially all the money is concentrated in these tier one cities and all the attention is concentrated in the tier one cities. You said half a million? Half a million and over? Half a million, 500,000. Okay. Numbers could be a little off. It updates on right. the Yeah, but it's somewhere in the, in the ballpark. Yeah, it's essentially population distribution. Okay. So if you've got a lot of people in one city, that's a tier one city. Um, Obviously, we have numbers that are ridiculous. Anyone who goes, yeah, a city with 300,000 is small. Right. That only happens in India and China. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, the, what we do is we go out to these tier 2, tier 3, tier 4 locations, which have relatively smaller populations of 100,000 people. Yeah. Places that uh, national television wouldn't go and say, hey, we're going to set up a bureau here and cover this properly. Makes sense. So local events, stuff like some something as simple as, hey, this road has been destroyed. Don't go here. There's work going on. Take the alternate route. Something mm-hmm. as small as that just doesn't get covered. It's entirely based on word of mouth. Makes sense. And the second thing is, I don't know if you're aware, but um, in 2016, a company called Reliance Geo launched a phone and a very, very cheap data package, a 4G data package, which is the cheapest in the world at the moment, I think. I see. So we suddenly went from about 200 million people in India who could use the internet who had access to the internet and who could afford it to about 700, 800 million people in the last few years. And it's just growing. That's crazy. So suddenly this is millions, hundreds of millions of people who are a new market. Makes sense. So they don't, these are people you tap into, right? You don't need to worry about setting up a print publication and the print uh, machinery and all that. Right. Do it all online and distribute it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What about the difference like mentally and culturally as well between t- different tire cities? So like I know people in, in Europe and in America, it's very different if you live in uh, Barcelona or Madrid versus if you live in the middle of rural uh, Spain. So, so yeah. how does that play out I- in India as well? So it's, yeah, it's very similar. It's similar to what we were talking about earlier is the guys in tier one India they're the guys who go on holidays to Europe. They're the guys who go on holidays to America. So it's becoming a little, little westernized. You see English hoardings all over the place. I mean, that's partly because of a British uh, colonial influence. Yeah. But it's very common, you know, to see people walking around in Western clothes, adopting Western attitudes, watching Western shows, the huge Netflix hoardings, stuff like that. Versus tier two, tier three, India. Is maybe a little distance off. It's maybe India, tier one India in the 90s. Right. So you can get a can of Coke, you can, you know, read uh, an American newspaper, but it's not permeated through the culture. It's Makes not sense. something everyone does. Makes sense so, for sure. Yeah. So it's a little more, um, I don't know how to put this, a little more still centered on the SMEs in their cities. Right. The local store still plays a big role. Um, all of these kind of small, small things, neighborhoods are still a big deal. Communities are still a big deal. Uh, you're more connected with your community compared to a tier one city, which is possibly more connected to 
New York or London than yeah. they are to their own community. That's so interesting. Um, you know, obviously, you've got migrants going up and down between cities. But there was an interesting study done recently. Um, so it's always been assumed that, hey, if you live in a smaller city, you want to come to a bigger city, get better jobs, all of that. Right. But now with the digital connection we have, we can do surveys, we can do proper reports of people living in tier three, tier four towns. And the really interesting thing that came out is a lot of people don't want to move to big cities. They want to sit in their city. They want to make big city salaries. They want big city jobs. Right. But they don't want to move. They don't want that, you know, that industrial, revol- mig- industrial revolution migration that happened in the West. They don't want that. Right. And with the digital revolution, in fact, you can do so many jobs sitting at home. It's not really necessary. And this lockdown is forcing people to figure out how to do it as well. I, I love that. It, it's interesting. And we will have to speak for three hours about this, but how, <laughs> um, well, different cultures the same trends happen across different countries, right? Because in, in Spain, like you said, um, tier one cities, if you want to put it like that, which in Spain, maybe we'll have like four or five, but they're much more interna- internationalized. They're, uh, there's a different mentality versus rural, which communities are still more important and all that. Uh, so like the same thing happened in Spain, and I think the same thing happens in the United States. It just, it's adapted to each country, but the, the trends I think are global, which right. I think makes a lot of sense. Um, one of the other things that I think a, a lot of Americans and Europeans wonder, uh, in terms of your government and your legal system, how do you see that? Uh, do you think it's helping socially? Do you think it's entrepreneurship supportive? Uh, like what should somebody from, that doesn't know anything about India know about the government, about your legal system? So there are definitely hurdles, especially if you're foreigner. There are limits on how much you can invest, how much you can own entities, um, import taxes on certain industries. And our patent laws are more geared towards societal use than protecting entrepreneurial ideas. For example, especially our health laws okay. are very geared towards, hey, if there's a solution out there, we're not going to pay an American company a large sum. We're just okay. going to build a similar product and yeah. give them a royalty if they're okay with it. Um, but it's hard to tell really because these laws are constantly changing. Like I said, the, the birth of startups and the popularization of startups. Everyone talks about startups. The main newspapers, the main economic newspapers and financial newspapers and websites yeah. talk about startups a lot. I see. So a company like Flipkart, which is an e-commerce site, which is uh-huh. a competitor to Amazon, got bought by Walmart for about $14, $15 billion wow. uh, a couple of years ago. So it's really blowing up, right? Acquisitions are that make you think, hey, this is a viable way to go forward. So the government definitely sees it as an opportunity and definitely sees that, hey, there are problems here. But there are minor issues that get in the way because we still have problems with money laundering. I see. Uh, angel investing suddenly becomes suspect, right? Because you're making up valuations and you're giving it to people. Right. How that's very easy to use for money laundering. Yeah. You could say, hey, I believe in this company. Here's a million dollars. So to put that in place, there are taxes in place, there are forms, you're going to fill out a lot of bureaucracy, which has, you know, the right motives, but ends up being impediments of business. Makes sense. And then there are a lot of, you know, social issues we have that we're going through with this government, which don't make business conducive. Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, That's a mix for sure. It's a good overview. Um, and how do you feel as a personal opinion, but like, how do you feel about the social environment? Like, how do you feel uh, as socially as, as a country? Like, how do you think you guys are doing? Do you guys think you guys are uh, like getting better or you're already good? <clears throat> For example, like just to give you a, an example, I think in Spain, socially, there's a lot of um, fight and battle between Spanish people and Catalan, which they're trying to be independent, which is creating a lot of like pressure socially and the economic crisis of 2008 was better, but that was really hard for the country. So like that's the overview in Spain. How would that overview in India be? So see the last year or so and the pandemic has made it worse. The economy has been slowing down a little bit. From all the markets, I'm no economist, but the markets I've seen, the news reports I've seen, right, um, seems to be slowing down, which obviously means unemployment is going up a little bit, and that tends to always lead to social issues. Yeah. Now, 
we have traditional issues as well, and stuff like caste, which is just not great for people, let alone for business. But on the other hand, there's just so much opportunity. Makes sense. There's so much. So, I mean, one of the biggest companies in India, or big startups to be fair, not companies, is a company called Ola, which is essentially an Uber competitor. I see. And they've raised millions, they're a unicorn as well, they've raised billions of dollars from the same investors, in the same soft bank, everyone is still involved. So it's not, there are a lot of ideas from the West, which have been honed, and even in China, which have been honed in hyper competitive markets, which can be brought to India. And if you're smart enough, you can tweak it for the Indian population. And you'll get like maybe a year where you get to play with that before people start ripping you off. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I, I, I love that. Yeah. I think that makes yeah, sense. Yeah. So there's definitely socially, I don't know. I mean, I am not a fan of the government. So maybe I'm yeah. not the bi- unbiased. Yeah, but, you need. I mean, I want your, your opinion personally. So yeah. whatever you I'm think. I'm not a fan of the government. I mean, socially, I don't know if we're going in the right direction. Okay. Economically, I think it's standing down, but I don't think it's in a place which is irretrievable. I think this is partially made a lot worse because of the pandemic. Makes sense. But yeah, um, I'm optimistic just because I'm an optimistic guy. Gotcha. I think that what's happening today, and I studied history in college, so I know that what's happening today doesn't necessarily dictate what's going to happen tomorrow. Right. A year from now, we could be in an entirely different situation. Makes sense. So I'm, I mean, that's, you study any history of any country in the last hundred years and life isn't cyclical anymore. Stuff right. is completely different. Yeah. yeah. Germany in 1929 compared to Germany in 1935, very different places. Of course. Yeah. America 10 years ago, America today. I mean, yeah. Nothing, nothing is permanent. I mean, you've got a base that's free enough. And I think India, for all of our flaws, we are relatively free. I love we that. are still a democracy somehow, despite the fact that we've got a billion plus people. We are a democracy. Maybe not the best functioning democracy, maybe not the best functioning federalist, but we are, which is kind of a miracle. Yeah. yeah so I think sure. as long as we have that freedom, there's definitely, we're tilted towards progress rather versus anything else. I think that's really interesting. And the, the last question from the business side, and then we'll touch on marketing a little bit because I know you have to go a bit. Um, what's your perception or, or what's the average Joe perception of Americans and Europeans that come to India? Like, do you think it's looked down upon negatively or do you think they're supportive of them? I think it's definitely positive. We love Americans. We love Europeans. We love visitors. I mean, yeah, it's Americans, Europeans especially, get mm-hmm. a huge, huge, um, it goes back to that hospitality thing. They just gotcha. love, we love people coming down. We love meeting new people. We love interacting with new people, especially country. Rich countries, places like America, like England, like different parts of Europe, but we've heard of them and we want to, you know, touch and feel the people that we've seen on TV. Makes sense. So it's definitely fascination. Cool, cool, cool. That, that's good yeah. to know. And, yeah. and now moving to like the marketing side, mm. um, where, like, what are the main challenges that Indian marketers are facing? I know, like, what are they missing from the United States that you see people, American companies are doing? Uh, and like, what are the major trends that you're seeing in marketing? Like, I don't know, for example, Spain seems to be like five years behind marketing in America. Uh, so. Do you see that happening in India or do you think marketing in India is in a good place? No, no. I think marketing in India is still digital marketing. Traditional marketing, I think, is quite brilliant. Right. But digital marketing, I think, is very rudimentary at the moment. Uh, because one fact that digital marketing just became viable in the last decade. Yeah. Two is, I think a lot of people, unfortunately, a lot of companies have been built in the last 15 years. I've seen Facebook and Google as the primary form of marketing. And really, right. that should be the end of your sales funnel. That's the guys you convert, not the guys you show off your product to. Right. The, yeah. So there's, I mean, simple things like content marketing is either doesn't exist or is done for the sake of it. Of just put out something and move on. There's no right. idea of what is a brand position, what is a brand value, what are we chasing? Makes sense. What, what do we bring to the customer? Right. A right. lot of marketing is still focused on what do we do It's future-focused marketing rather than benefit-focused marketing. Makes sense. Yeah. So there is definitely scope for improvement when it comes to digital marketing. 
But the second issue here is what we talked about earlier is we're just so heterogeneous. How right. do you build an ad that taps into everyone's feelings? I mm-hmm. mean, the traditional guys who've been doing it on TV have got a little bit of it. I mean, you know, the bigger companies that sell products like soap, which everyone just needs. Right. That works. People who sell phones, everyone yeah. wants a phone. Those kind of things which don't tap into a specific section of society, a specific demographic or a TG, and have been around for a while, they understand that marketing has got a lot to do with branding, especially in a country like India, which is very value for money. People yeah. are not ready to buy things to try it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, so it must be hard yeah. because you guys have have very different like society in terms of like how heterogenic you are. Uh, so like segmenting and targeting ha- has to be complicated for sure. Uh, yeah, how yeah. about how about like the B two B space? Like what do you see in the B two B space? Uh, not, not in terms of marketing, but um, comparing B two B and agencies with uh, America, how do you see the B two B in India landscape look like? Or or where are the B two B companies that you know? doing marketing nowadays and do you think that's working do you think it's effective so i think b2b b2b is actually pretty good in india i think um that's see i can't really compare to america because i don't know the details of how that system works right but the b2b in india works pretty well like it's um i'm going to give you an example of i know a couple of people who've got a year old company that's a b2b warehousing company right you know, it helps people warehousing stuff and all and they've been hit pretty hard by the pandemic, right? Because everyone's got to sell at home. Yeah. But in the last week, they've ramped up again because a lot of these warehouses are opening up a little bit, but they don't have any employees because all the employees they had to furlough all went back to their towns. So there's a lot of migrant workers. Makes sense. Or they found other jobs because they had to survive. So these guys are reopening, but they don't have employees. And this middleman, who's a year old, a year and a half old, just in a week, built an entire digital platform product to connect jobs to people. And that. it's working smoothly because these B2B connections, they're very personal connections. Yeah. They're based on like a sort of an old, old boys club. Yeah. So to get stuff up and running fast, once you break into the club, it's easier. I mean, it still takes time. I mean, this is a very specific uh, example, which is running fast, but it's like any B2B that takes three months, four months, six months. Yeah. But I I think, I mean, from the amount that I've seen, it seems to be a fairly well-known process that everyone understands. Everyone knows when they're being sold to. Everyone knows how to sell to people. It takes time. You've got to go take them out for lunch. You know, hey, I bought you some sweets from my hometown when I'm in town. How are you doing? How's the wife? It's, yeah, yeah. you've got to do it. It's a churn, but there's definitely a process that works. Yeah. And that everyone has accepted like an unofficial industry standard. Makes sense. It seems like there's marketing opportunity, right? It seems like there's things that marketers could be doing. Like, do you think marketers, for example, steal from the like American marketing, for example? That's something we do in Spain. Like I, I see Spanish marketers stealing strategies from American marketers. Uh, for, for B2B especially. So think, yeah. So I think American, just because American marketing is so big, I mean, the fact that just the Super Bowl advertising, right? It makes headlines all over the world. Look at this. Look at the ad. Like, what's right. the best ad? Word? Stuff like that. American marketing is just so big that it's hard to ignore it and hard to ignore the practices. Yeah. But I'd say, see, any smart marketers, you've got to constantly be looking at. What are people doing in Spain, in America, right. whatever, in Brazil, South Korea, whatever. It's a good whatever. point. Yeah, I mean, when you've got platforms like Medium, where these people are coming out and talking about what they're doing on a daily basis, or yeah. LinkedIn for that matter, if you can get the right connection, any smart marketer should, whether Indians are doing it or not, whether they're comfortable in the fact that, hey, I've got these connections, the connections are paying me enough to survive. Makes that's sense. definitely a debate. I think there's definitely opportunity to change that. I mean, that's what we're trying to do with local, is change the way businesses are done. Yeah, yeah. But advertising is done at least. I 100% agree. So I have a couple more questions before we wrap this up. The the first one is something that I'm curious about, actually. Um, I, I don't know if you've seen it, but in America, there's a lot of gurus in marketing teaching you like the new strategies. I, I don't want to just talk about the gurus, but like, do you guys have 
marketing influencers in terms of like um, ma- guys that know a lot about marketing and then sharing it on social and they have a big following? Uh, like, do you guys have that type of role? So, actually, say I'm the worst person asked for this because I am. Um, I don't like influencers as a concept because I feel like if you follow an influencer, you get stuck in a certain person's biases without knowing what their biases are. Right. So I actively try to not do that. But Makes sense. I there's definitely some. Um, I don't know if they're as big as they are in America and Europe I because see. marketers, advertisers are not. This is a funny irony in Indian marketing is they're great at advertising their products. They're not very great at building their own brands. Uh, interesting. So the guys who are picking up are a lot of the younger generation who are figuring out Instagram and TikTok who are becoming micro influencers. I don't know if that's a term outside India. It's a major right. thing in India of you know people who have five thousand to ten thousand followers but who are very specific audience. Right. So this is this is a micro influencer who can talk about Nike sneakers from nineteen ninety five right. and you can sell them just that. Like yeah. that kind of very, very, very local micro influencer. So those are big, but the general, hey, I've got 10 million followers as a marketing guru. I don't know if that exists so much. That's interesting. That's interesting. Um, and the last question that I wanted to ask you, I am like over the last, I'd say th- three or six months, I've been really interested into how I can play out into that market. Um, I've had the chance to meet you and other individuals from there. And then, I think there's a lot of opportunity that I would like to to be a part of and be and enjoy, right? Um, I don't know how that looks like, but like, what do you think? What what advice would you give me if I wanted to like get into that scene in India one day and like start uh, building new relationships um, with Indian companies or Indian marketers? and have the opportunity to share what I know about content marketing and learn from, from you guys as well. Like what, how do you think that plays out? What advice would you give me personally? So I'd say, um, okay. So I think the best way to look at it is look at the media industry. Media industry always got the biggest reach, the biggest trust among audience. Um, and right now this specific moment, the lockdown is a great time to actually look at it for someone from outside because traditionally Indian business is done in person. Right. Uh, on the phone, video calls, that's not a very, it's a bit impersonal in Indian culture. So, but because we're all stuck at home right now, a lot of companies are trying to broach that, right? They're trying to do webinars, trying to do online conferences, stuff like that. Yeah. So there's two kind of companies. There are the digital media guys who have come up and who don't have print revenues to sustain them. They don't have government ad revenues to sustain them. So they've learned how to do events. I see. So they do them on a pretty consistent basis every quarter or so. Mm -hmm. So getting in touch with them as a foreign expert is definitely doable. I mean, the fact that, so one of the biggest event industries in India, a longstanding one is literature festivals. And there's always a very high number of foreigners who who are obviously, you know, impacted in India, who either work in India or wrote a book about India, something like that, who come and talk. So similarly, a lot of these financial uh, conferences, marketing conferences, advertising conferences, any B2B conferences would love a foreign perspective. I see. And at the same time, uh, the print guys have been getting more into it. They, they are more along the lines of we have an annual awards and we're prestigious and we go with these prestigious awards. But now because of the lockdown, print is going through a bit of a crisis. So India, unlike the rest of the world, print is still growing. Yeah. It's not going down. So they have been a little complacent. They're limited by the amount of supply, you know, the amount that they want to produce rather than the amount of people who want to buy. It. Makes sense. Makes sense. Newspapers are doing great. But now with everything locked down, you can't deliver a newspaper. Right. That basic fact is dead. Yeah. So newspapers are scrambling for new view avenues to keep their audiences. Of course. And conferences are popping up, webinars are popping up. Um, just get in touch with some editors. Right. That's the simplest way to break in. They'll put you on panels, get in touch with the fellow panelists, they'll put you in other panels they get invited right. to. Because everyone wants to be the guy that brought this new foreign perspective. Hello you want to be the guy with the connections in America and Europe. Makes sense. So if you walk and say, hey, I'm the connection, I want to try and get involved. 
I think there's an opportunity there. Um, I haven't tried it because I've not right. you know, the target group that could try it. But I think there's definitely an opportunity there. Reach out to a few editors for the industry you're in and see what they say. I love that. I'll definitely take your advice. Uh, Jared, I know you have to go. So uh, I just wanted to thank you so much for, for taking the time to do this. I thought it was great. And you gave me such, me and the listeners, such a great um, perspective and overview on like how to go into the market, how to do business there, um, where you guys are socially, um, politically, and legally. So I wanted to thank you so much for, for taking the time to do this. Thank you for having me. It was a fun conversation. Absolutely. Honestly, the time kind of flew. I didn't realize. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, where should people follow you? I know you write amazing articles on Medium. You should go check that out. We'll put the link below. Uh, but where should people connect with you, follow you? Where should they go? So I think LinkedIn is the best way to get in touch with me on a social media platform. I'm on Twitter as well, but I'm not too active with talking to people. Um, Medium, like you said, I've got a publication on Medium called Marketing to India. So check that out. I would love to get any feedback from anyone. Uh, and I can give you guys my email ID. You can always uh, get in touch there. It's uh, tarot at getlocalapp.com. Awesome. Um, we'll put the link to, to your LinkedIn in the description as well. Um, if you're listening, thank you so much. Uh, feel free to subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, whatever you're listening this. And we will see you next episode. Thank you, guys.